Good morning. Uh, welcome to Coffee with the Commissioner with Steve Turner. My guest today is Claire Cantwell from the Headlight Project. Good morning. Good morning. So, Claire, do you want to do you want to tell us who you are and what you do? Um, yeah. So, my name is Claire Cantwell, and I am a counsellor and a supervisor. Um, and um, the um, education um, lead for the Headlight Project. Okay. Um, and t- tell us a little bit about yourself. Did you grow up in Cleveland? Are you a, a local? I am, yes, I am. I grew up in Billingham, uh, Wolverston Court Estate, um, went to Northfield School. Um, yeah, and then um, went off and did my nurse training um, at Darlington Memorial Hospital. Okay. And then worked in London for a while and in Hampshire and in York. And then I settled um, at the Nuffield Hospital um, in Norton, where I stayed, um, was a sister there for 18 years. Um, and that's when I did my counselling training. Um, I sound like I'm 100 years old, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously yeah, not. Gosh. Um, yeah. So um, kind of late 80s, 90s, I um, started my counselling training in nursing then, so she started mm. in Darlington, London, Hampshire, York. Mm. Is that the type of thing, do you find massive variations when you're working regionally in a, in a role like that or is, is nursing nursing? I think it's one mm. of those things that I suppose a bit like police officers, we sort of look and say well, it doesn't really matter where you do the job, it's going to be very similar. Is nursing like that? Fundamentally, yes. Um, uh, but when I worked in London, it, it was very, very different just in... Um, uh, it was a private hospital and um, it, it was, uh, I want to say, it, unfriendly. Um, okay. But fundamentally, nursing is nursing. Um, and we, um, you know, that basic nursing care is absolutely crucial to the foundations of, of where you are with your patient. Okay. So... You moved on, you've got your degree, you've done counselling, mm-hmm. you're, you're well educated within that. Um, how did you come across the Headlight Project? I, w- I went on and did a teaching degree. So I was teaching um, counselling at um, Stockton Riverside College and Teesside University. And it was one of my colleagues who I'd worked with um, teaching counselling who had um, uh, got involved with um, Catherine Devereux. I was asked to by my colleague, um, would you come and meet um, Catherine and would you come and join us and work with the project? So um, it didn't take me much time to say yes. So I, I'm, I'm obviously aware of, of, of the, the headline project, but do you, do you want to tell tell our listeners what it is and how it came about? Okay. So the Headlight Project is a, is a charity, um, a local uh, Tees Valley charity who help families who have been affected by suicide. It came about because um, a local gentleman called uh, Russ Devereaux, um, a local businessman to the area, um, Devro Haulage Company, uh, red trucks in our area, which I'm sure many people will have seen. He um, took his own life in Mar- in May 2018, um, which completely um, devastated the Devro family. Um, Russ was a, a really lovely guy. Um, very well respected in the community. It was a May bank holiday weekend, Sunday afternoon, and Catherine and Russ and the three girls had been invited to a family barbecue. Um, And so they were getting ready to go. And for whatever reason, Russ said to Kath, you go ahead and I'll I'll follow you. So they were travelling from their home in Hutton Rugby to the barbecue which was in Norton and uh, Catherine got the girls and off she went 
And Russ did set off to go to the barbecue and he was on the A19 going northbound and he turned his car around um, and he took his own life um, from Leven Bridge um, and he, he never arrived at the barbecue. And Catherine um, struggled to find some help for herself and for her girls and she decided to start a charity to help families who had been affected by suicide because her and her girls and her family and the whole Devereux community were affected um, drastically and, you know, horrendously. And how old was Russ at that time? So Russ was 41 years old at that time um, when he took his own life. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And that's, it, it is such a, such a terrible story for, mm. for something as, as forward looking as the, the Headlight Project to come out of. And I think with, with suicide, many, many, many of our listeners won't realise it. So suicide is the biggest single cause of, of death in men under 45 in this country. That's right. Um, and and 75% of all suicides are male. That's right. Um, yeah. And and that, that is quite a, a, a damning statistic. Mm. And, and here in the North East... It's 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 worse still. Those those figures are worse. So why why do you think that is? Well, it's a really really difficult question. So nationally, so the um, the Office for National Statistics, uh, their figures are um, usually about two years behind. Yeah. So we're 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 still on twenty twenty one figures. And in 2021, 5,583 suicides were recorded in England and Wales. Um, 1,751 were young people, uh, 100 university students, um, 200 school children each year take their own life. That's four school children every week taking their own life. And in the northeast, we are known as the suicide capital of the UK, and we have had the highest figures for six out of the last ten years. Why? We don't know. So, because the people who are taking their own lives take their story with them. We know that poverty is um, a factor. We know that gender is a factor. We know that age is a factor. We know that relationship problems are a, fa a factor. We know that uh, drugs and alcohol are a factor. However, if we look at Russ, Russ was, was a guy who, who just had, you know, a beautiful wife, beautiful children, a business, beautiful home, but he took his own life. Ten days before he took his own life, there had been an incident with one of his drivers. Um, it was in another yard um, uh, down south, and that driver lost his life. And that really affected Russ. Um, he really took that on board, and it set off an acute um, anxiety, stress, that nobody knew to the extent that he might take his own life. People who have suicidal thoughts we know um, mask and hide how they're feeling and if they're not able to express how they're feeling for whatever reason, then they it gets it becomes like a little iceberg. So on the, on the tip, they're seemingly okay, but underneath, you know, there's lots of things happening for them in the mind. But we, we don't know why our figures are so high, um, other than those national things like poverty, 
drugs, alcohol, relationship problems, gender, they are a factor. They are in the mix. And it's interesting to hear you say that because I've had personal experience of, of both um, attempted suicide and suicide mm. and, and, and lost a, a friend to, to suicide some years back. Um, and and those things you talk about weren't factors. No. Weren't factors for, no. for, for anybody involved. Mm. Um, and, and yes, but the, I suppose the trials and tribulations and the stresses of modern life are, are a big factor, mm. um, which I suppose brings us on to to sort of the mental health side of that. People mm. people bandy the word mental health around mm. quite a lot mm. without really truly understanding because mm. it it can be different things to different people. From from one extreme where somebody has se- severe mental health challenges and need a, needs medication and, and mm. professional support, mm. to the other end of the scale where I suppose we all think about mental health in, in our own mind and whether that's a, a good thing. You can have good mental health as well as yeah, poor absolutely. mental health. Yeah. What what do you think what do you think we can do to to try and recognise signs in other people where things might not be quite right? Generally, we know our best friend. Generally we know our brother, our sister, our partner. Um our colleague, maybe. And generally, we might notice something change in their behaviour, be it um, that they are more grumpy than they normally are, they're more anxious, their confidence isn't the same, they become withdrawn, um, they become reckless, they become um, things that are not usual for them things that change they become quiet when normally they're really chatty um they 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 withdraw from a task that normally they're amazing at these are the things that we need to ask people are you okay you seem a little bit anxious but the answer Um, will always be yes and with then we ask again Are you okay? Are you really okay? But by being given permission to think about yourself, it enables that person to think, right, okay, someone does care. Somebody is willing to listen to me. Somebody is giving me the time just to stop and say, well, actually, I am feeling a little bit anxious. Well, actually, my confidence isn't like it used to be. And by doing that, it helps people to just start to talk. And if we talk about suicide, there are lots of myths and stigmas and shame even attached to suicide. Some people find it difficult to even just say the word suicide. But research shows that by asking somebody, are you thinking of taking your own life, then you could actually save that person's life. Because that question enables that person to look at you and say, well, actually, I am really struggling. And actually, I, I want to give up. Actually, what's the point? And by having that conversation, you can help that person stay safe for now, for that next minute, that next hour. Because Research again shows that the majority of people who are feeling suicidal and who have suicidal thoughts, they don't want to die. They just want how they're feeling right there and then to stop. They want how they're feeling right there and then to change, to be different. And and do you think that that is the important part then, is, is helping people reframe how they see things and and how they perceive their their life or their moment to be yeah absolutely completely absolutely i think to help our mental health we have to talk we have to talk about how we are feeling we have to look at our world and whoever's listening has to be non-judgmental in the way that they are listening Because 
whatever somebody is worried about at that time, whatever feelings they're having that are troubling them are relevant to that person. They might not be to you or I, but to that person, it is changing their their mind and their thinking. And, and do you think that talking point is, and I suppose it brings us back to the to the number of men and, and men under 45, do you think that element of of not being able to open up and share your feelings and share share what's going through your your head with somebody. Um, men are terrible for it, and, and I speak as a man. Yeah, um, yeah. For, from that perspective, so do you, do you think that then is potentially a driving factor within that statistic as well? I do, I do. Sadly, and I what do. do you think we can do to help combat that? Well, well, I think I think generations are changing. Now I can speak, but I have two boys, one's 28 and one is 24. They talk more than the next generation, their dads. I know that my boys check on their friends. I know, I've seen them hug their friends. I've seen them, um, talk. they talk to me about their friends. So I think Generations are changing a little bit. But I think m men used to go to the pub and they used to stand at the bar and they used to say, you know, the wife's getting on my nerves or, you know, I can't bear work or, you know, I'm worried about our so-and-so. Or uh, We used to talk to our neighbours. Our neighbours used to come into our homes. Our communities knew each other more than... I think that they do now. We People used to go to church and use their faith more than I think they do now. Men used to talk at work because at work they got a break. Now no work gets a break, I don't think. Um, I know nursing and teaching, you don't get a break. Whereas you used to talk about, you know, I used to know you know, staff nurses, so and so's little girl wasn't very well. So I used to remember to ask. And I'd say, oh, how's so and so? Whereas you just don't get a break anymore. You don't you don't talk. We work in our car. We mm. work we work everywhere. We just work. Life um, comes at you fast these it days. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And so I think we've lost that where a man can just, just you know, offload or just regurgitate something. And, and that is really worrying really really worrying but we need to change the perception that you know it, it you don't need to have this macho persona it's not even attractive to have this macho persona it's more attractive to be open it's more attractive to say i am feeling this i need help with this can you help me with this i'm struggling because Generally, people like to help each other. Just just moving on there, you, you've been involved with the Headlight Project for years. Yes. What do you think is the the most impactful thing you've come across? Or what, what's, mm. what struck you the most, positively or negatively? Or both? Mm. Yeah, well, that's such a good question. And what hits me every single day as a counsellor having the privilege of being in a room with somebody who is sharing how they are feeling and where they are at that moment. But the sheer pain and sadness and heartache and disbelief and denial and what ifs, if only, I should have. That's heartbreaking on a daily basis. Absolutely. How do you cope with that yourself? How 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 mm. do you protect yourself from that? Yeah, well, we're not robots. That's one thing. You know, I am mega human. And one of the core conditions of being a counselor is to be congruent, is to be genuine. And if I'm feeling upset, I will say to my client you know, I'll say, I, I, it, that's really got to me. 
And by being real, it allows my client to be real. Um, but we are qualified, we're competent, we are trained. What I also see, and again, it's a huge privilege, that somebody who is completely broken and often suicidal themselves because their grief is so ginormous that they think, right, I want to be with them. And I have one client at the moment that I contract with every single week, every session, for her to come back because she wants to die because her grief is massive. Yeah. And, you know, when she comes through the door the next session, I think, phew, here she is. How many? So, so the Headlight Project, obviously you, you're doing some great work in, in educational establishments and you, you, you're taking that message of effectively suicide prevention, mm. being able to talk and, mm. and people understanding and reframing how they feel. Mm. And then obviously you're working with families and individuals as well. Yeah. If, if there was one thing, if there was one message that we could help the Headlight Project get across, what do mm. you think that message would be? It would be to talk about suicide. That, that is the message. We have to talk about suicide. We're talking about real people who take their own lives, somebody's mum, somebody's dad, somebody's husband, wife, brother, sister, friend, soulmate. We're talking about real people. And if we talk more about suicide, we will start to reduce our numbers. Claire, you've been amazing. Thank you. I, I don't think I've done a podcast yet where, where what the guests had to say has resonated with me. As, as, as much as you have you. Um, uh, yeah I'm not going to lie it, it does it does fail it does hit you mm. in there and um, I'd never I was aware of Russ's story but never heard it told quite the same way mm. and and the work the, the project does is fantastic yeah. so I, I would actively encourage anybody who who feels this is that there are so many calls on people to support different things and yeah. And, and every one of them's worthy. And every one of them's worthy. Absolutely. But sometimes you've just got to find something that that touches you and and means something to you for a reason. And and I always find that whenever I've done fundraising in the past, where where it means something to people, there is there's a, a sense of purpose in yeah. giving rather than just yeah. there's my loose change yeah. or there's a there's a donation because yeah. I'm ticking a box. Yeah. So, yeah. so Thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Good Thank luck you. with the project and everything you do. Thank you. Um, and and please thank everybody at the, at the Headlight Project for, for, for what they do. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's been today's Coffee with the Commissioner, um, recorded here again at Flock in Middlesbrough. Um, it's been great to spend some time with you today, Claire. Thank you very much, and we'll see you all again next time.